Hey all, uh, thank you for joining us today for this presentation, The Human Heart, Engaging Emotions in RPG Design at Metatopia Online 2020. Hello. Hi, welcome if you're in the chat or you're watching. Um, before we get started, we'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we are presenting this talk from today, the Gadigal and Wangal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. And for those of you who don't know us yet, hello, I'm V Hendro. This is Hayley Gordon, and we are from Story Brewers Roleplaying. Uh, we've been designing and self-publishing games for about three and a half years now, and we focus a lot of our game design on play experiences that are both emotional and collaborative. Uh, here's some of the net games just we've designed to run you through them. We've got Alas for the Awful Sea, Good Society, Jane Austen RPG, the expanded acquaintance version of Good Society, which is a compendium book, six expansions for Good Society. I don't know why we did that to ourselves, but there it is. <laughs> it's just gone out in the mail uh, in the last two days. So that's mm. really exciting. Uh, and then we've also got two one-shot like little box games that we're calling them, which is one's called Village Song, and that's about village leadership inspired by pre-colonial Java, and our mundane supernatural life, which is about a day in the life of a supernatural person and their loved one. Yeah, so a lot of our focus has been on designing new systems with unique approaches to emotionally immersive play. Um, and since our games tend to focus on drama and emotions, it's no wonder that we've spent some considerable time pondering how we can make games that better draw players into the emotional space of the game in a way that is also responsible and supportive. Uh, so in other words, how can we make anguish and yearning an enjoyable experience? <laughs> So that's what our talk is going to be on today. Um, this talk is aimed at people who are looking at designing their own RPG or more RPGs if you already have. And we will be taking a designer's perspective, what we can do as RPG designers to help create better emotional storytelling in our games. Yeah. So before we jump into it, there's a few bits of housekeeping, um, just a couple of things. The first is that we will be taking questions at the end of the talk. So uh, if you have a substantial question, uh, please write it down and save it for the end. Via uh, the Twitch chat. Yes. Yes. Um, we'll be talking for about 40 minutes. So there's going to be lots of time for questions afterwards. If there's anything that we're explaining that isn't super clear as we're explaining it, if we are, we do have the chat up. So if you drop it in there, we can um, try to explain it better. Uh, but big questions at the end. Secondly, uh, we just take a moment to note that this talk is just our own thoughts and opinions mm -hmm. on designing uh, emotional games we understand everyone designs differently and there's like really no right way to do it so this talk is about us sharing what has worked for us and like fingers crossed hoping that that's going to be helpful and interesting to all of you out there mm -hmm. so today we are going to cover the following points uh first we're going to start with a brief introduction to the concept of emotional storytelling and what we mean when we refer to feels first design mm -hmm. Secondly, we'll broadly outline some ethical considerations in engaging with that sort of design. And thirdly, and this will be most of the talk, we'll take a look at some practical approaches that we use as game designers when we are engaging in Fields First Design. And we'll be covering uh, three tools, buy-in, player agency, and fictional leaders. So we'll talk about what these are um, and how they help with emotional storytelling and how you might use them. So to jump into that first point, uh, emotional storytelling, whoops. Um, our starting premise is that all RPGs engage our emotions. People, humans, we relate to each other in terms of stories. We always have, we probably always will. <laughs> stories that are personal and emotionally engaging uh, use more of our brains and lead our like bodies to react physically, you know, releasing cortisol in tense moments or like dopamine when we have a happy ending. This is what science tells us. <laughs> But basically, we remember stories that engage us personally better, and we're more likely to be transformed by them. So by the mere fact that they are stories, all RPGs engage the emotional side of us mm. humans. But role-playing games are especially powerful because they actively engage participants of them in the act of storytelling. Um, as long as you are playing a solo game, that act of storytelling also happens in like an emotional social context, which is just another layer of engagement on top of all of that. And that's why RPGs are a powerful force. So emotional storytelling is what is happening when we play games together 
uh, to and engage emotionally in the shared fiction. What's great about designing tabletop role-playing games in particular, I think, is that it's a really unique narrative medium that allows us as designers to modify both like the way the story is shaped, how, how people present that story, and how that story is received by the participants of that group, game group. Um, which leads us to this first idea of fields first design, which is something that we just sort of made up as a term. <laughs> Uh, so by our account, feels first design is what you are doing as an RPG game designer to achieve better emotional storytelling in your game. It's how you design your game to help players better engage and control the emotional flow of their play experience. So feels first design is an approach that encompasses not only creating emotional play, but making sure that it's used in a responsible way. It's about being deliberate as to the emotional space of your game. Yeah. So we both, before we delve into sort of the practical part of our talk, um, we first wanted to address the specific um, ethical considerations that are brought up when designing games with the intention of engaging player emotions. Uh, we, as we said, strongly believe this is part of being responsible game designers. Mm. So the first thing we do uh, yes, so the first thing you need to do is consider how your game affects players. Um, and for us, this really cat covers three areas. Um, emotional intensity. How likely is your game to involve heightened emotions? Is it really scary? Is it really sad? How long a player is going to experience these emotions for? Uh, secondly, the likelihood for bleed. So uh, bleed is where the feelings of a player's character carries over into their personal life all the other way around. Games that involve closer relationships and more character embodiment tend to evoke more bleed, but it can also depend on the design and the context of the game. Uh, and thirdly, the intensity of the interpersonal relationships in the game. So how intimate are the relationships between the characters and in particular the player characters? For example, are they lovers? Are they family? How much stress is put on these relationships? So our game, Good Society, is basically a game that is focused on the drama of romance and of family, which means the relationships between the characters are very intimate and intense. Um, and you'll need to consider each of these points in your game design. Games that have more intensity and more intimate interpersonal relationships are going to need more supportive tools to deal with this. And this is not just about safety tools, although those are important. Mm. In general, players will need more control, more support, and more flexibility where these aspects are heightened. So depending on your game, you might also need a debrief as well. Uh, Playtesting can help with this. It's a really important part of understanding how your game affects players, and it gives you the data that you need to calibrate your game well. Yeah, so we, we sort of mentioned safety tools into the game. We won't go on too long about that because there's like a lot of information about safety tools out there, and it's also would have been an entire talk <laughs> we're not yeah. ready to give at this point in time. But suffice to say that we feel um, safety tools are extremely important and it's extremely important to specifically address the emotional risks in your game proactively. And um, that means building safety tools into your game. Uh, the more you actually understand about your own game and how it affects players, which you do through play testing, uh, the more you'll understand the specific risks involved and like be able to build a bespoke solution for your game. Yeah. So that's that's sort of just, um, yeah, so we'll move on to the next point. Yeah, so for the rest of this talk, uh, we are going to be talking about three specific tools we use to connect our game design to better emotional play. And it's good to note here, these are just tools we personally use and there are endless other approaches and ways to go about it. Uh, but these three tools are what we've found to be most effective in our own experience. Yeah, so these are the three tools that we're going to talk about today, buy-in, player agency, and fictional leaders. We'll be talking about each of these tools separately. Uh, however, of course, they're all very interrelated in a game design. When you design, uh, we encourage you to think about each of these things separately and how they're being used in your game. But when you finish, you, you will find that some of your mechanics will actually address all three at the same time. Um, it's a good way to look for gaps, like maybe something is so strong as a fictional lever that it's actually overriding player agency or similar. Um, 
question. There is a quick question. When you make these games, do you take any consideration into it? I think oh, that's taking the questions end. at the end, oh, as, right. we, as you said yourself earlier. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, post that at the end of the sesh. Oh, um, yeah, we can scroll back. Yeah, so let's send to the first tool, buy-in. Um, yeah, so starting with buy-in. Buy-in is the emotional investment that players have in a game. Uh, demonstrated by the acceptance of and willing, willingness to actively support and participate in the fiction and the story. It is the attachment that participants of your game have to the story and characters and their vested interest in what happens next in that story. Um, we would consider buy-in to be a prerequisite condition for emotional storytelling because without buying in, Participants of your game have little reason to engage emotionally. So players won't care about the fiction or may experience a mismatch between the fiction and their expectations of the fiction. Without sufficient buy-in, players basically aren't ready to go on the emotional journey that your particular game provides. So the question for this section is how to help players buy into your game uh, and specifically your game's emotional space. Um, from our experience, the two best ways we found to do this is A, informed consent, and B, player authorship. So mm. we'll, we'll tackle each of these separately. Um, informed consent, this is about players knowing what is coming up ahead in the game, uh, what, kind, what kind of content might appear, and how it might appear in the game. Um, and for them to enthusiastically be able to opt in and say, like, yes, I want to be a part of this. I'm excited for what is coming up next. Mm. So from the perspective of someone playing your game, often the first time they're able to determine what kind of content might appear is through a game blurb or game overview. And, and these are important for starting to set expectations, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but you can also tell people about the kind of game they're going to be playing through many other things, the game's aesthetics, your game materials, your character creation process. All of these things sort of build up a contextual mm -hmm. picture. So as an example, I was going to pull in this, this uh, Star Wars Force and Destiny character sheet, um, where I think that if you, if you, I don't have a picture of it, the front picture tells you Star Wars very clearly. But when you pick up this character sheet, even before you like start, the very first section, like prominent section, is this section about, um, which has your soak value, wounds, strain, and defense. Uh, that's what those four boxes are. So by picking up this character sheet, you're already in that headspace knowing that there's going to be combat and that we'll be trying to stay alive in this game. The only thing above that is this little box that has the force right next to where it says force and destiny. So that gives you like a big picture of what you're getting into. Um, the other example that we have is um, of how a game might elicit informed consent is from uh, this game Girl Underground, which is a game about a... It's like Alice in Wonderlandy about a curious girl in a wondrous world. Um, before you start playing this game, uh, players in the on the table come up with manners that they want to challenge during the session and put these on index cards in the middle of the table. Manners are things like young ladies must always be grateful for what they are given um, or young ladies must always go by she. Um, so you can choose these from a list or uh, make up your own manner. And this exercise right at the beginning of the game is awesome because it lets players choose from the outset what uh, challenging issues will appear in the game. And they actually start the game informed as to what is going to happen and enthusiastic about these things because they pick them themselves. So mm. that's uh, informed consent. From this, we can see how it's really important to be clear about the content and context of your game. Uh, when a group of people form shared expectations, like that's the first step to effectively telling an emotional story together. Mm. I think the other thing about informed consent is that many people think of it as a thing that happens at the beginning of the game that you set and forget. For example, this is a horror game. There'll be terrifying creatures in it. You know, will everyone be okay with that? Um, but actually, Informed consent is broader than that and needs to take place throughout gameplay um, as the ability to withdraw consent is important. Um, so, for example, um, in our game, Good Society, there is a phase at the beginning of the game called collaboration where players sort of configure their game ahead and it asks questions like, 
what is the tone? What do we want to see? What, what don't we? Um, and to avoid this happening just once in the game and being forgotten, it's also reviewed every upkeep phase, meaning players revisit, discuss, or amend their previous decisions at regular intervals. And it's our experience that people do do this, that this opportunity is important to them. The other part of buy-in uh, that we found to be really helpful is this idea of player authorship. So player authorship is the degree to which players contribute to creating aspects of the fiction, be that things about their characters, the world, anything. Um, it's the ability for players to contribute fiction both at the outset, but also throughout the game that creates this continuous buy-in mm. that heightens emotional engagement in the game. Adding fictional details, um, like really small stuff, the room we go in is lavish, the dining table is covered in a red cloth. Adding those fictional details gives people the opportunity to highlight things that interest them. And it also creates a stronger connection to those things because they're the ones who sort of made it up and shared it with the group in the first place. It gives you that sort of like, I birthed it, so I have responsibility <laughs> over it. Yeah, so it's worth thinking about how to include opportunities for player authorship throughout your game. And the best way to do this um, is to make the tools for creating and contributing fiction clear, explicit, and easy to use. The most obvious example is a blank space on a character sheet, right? But you only fill that in once. And as designers, we need to think beyond that to more continuous forms of input. So some examples we've got of that is in Fellowship, uh, there is a move called Command Law that says, when someone asks something about your character or your people, tell them. When you ask about another character or their people, they will tell you the answer. And when you ask about the overlord, they alone may choose not to answer. So this set of three statements is a very clear, very obvious way of dividing play input and encouraging continuous buy-in. Uh, by having this like written prominently on the basic move sheet, it constantly reminds players they can ask, they can answer. The overlord can choose not to and be mysterious. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's... Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to uh, the second tool we are going to um, talk about today, and that is player agency. So where buy-in is about understanding and contributing to the fiction, player agency is the actual ability of players to shape what happens next in the story. Player agency should not be confused with character agency. It doesn't matter what the player's characters can or cannot do. Uh, it's about the players themselves. However, the ability of characters to impact the story is usually a good yardstick for whether player agency itself exists. Player agency is a vital part of player safety and enjoyment. It creates better storytelling, emotional storytelling, uh, because it puts players in the driver's seat. And by doing so, lets them be vulnerable and engage. Without it, players can feel powerless to affect the story and like the outcomes, uh, fictional outcomes are inevitable. So with it, it creates a genuine ability to shape the story. Mm. Um, so how do we establish player agency? There's two approaches that we'll be talking about. The first is um, be aware of who decides things in your game and be support player choice. So these are the two things we'll talk about next. Yeah. So let's start with this idea of who decides in your game and when. So um, you can analyze the contributions that you are asking for from the people playing your game and look at when are decisions made and by who and who do they affect. You need to be clear about this in your rule sets, uh, when and how are decisions made about what happens next and who gets to make them. And of course, not everyone can make every decision but players need to have the overall feeling that they have a significant say in setting the course of the story. So when we play a game, we're all constantly contributing, constantly collaborating. The question is, do players feel that they have the influence they need during the game? So our viewpoint is that it's positive to make this explicit in your game. And there are lots of ways that you can do this. Yep. So... One example is in Good Society. In uh, the game, you have a currency called Resolve Tokens. You use these tokens to change uh, events that, of the game that's going to happen next. For example, you could overturn a carriage, you could overhear a secret conversation, reveal that secret. 
Um, but however, when you use this token and it would harm or compel another player's character to do something or say something, you offer that token to them and they can either accept or reject the fictional consequences of what you're saying that token is. So I can be like, Haley, can I overhear your conversation? Um, or at least Lady <laughs> Darlington's conversation. And Haley, because it's it going to affect you, you can choose to accept that or refuse that result token. So everyone is sort of empowered to make decisions about what's going to happen next by offering these result tokens. But players who are affected, uh, player character, players whose characters are affected by that. Uh, also are empowered to refuse them. Hmm, yeah, but there is um, another and even more obvious and commonly used example of demarcating player agency that we see in games all the time, and that is simply taking turns. Uh, the game Eleanor is a really clear example of this. The players take turns, but it still feels like it's part of one flowing narrative. It's clear when a player has agency to say what happens next, it happens on their turn. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that game. Uh, so uh, let's let's talk about now how you can support player choice, which is actually a very important part of player agency. So particularly for emotional storytelling, player agency is best exercised when players feel comfortable and confident making choices. Without enough support in the game, agency can be useless or just difficult and unpleasant. So it kind of defeats the purpose of building it into your game in the first place. Uh, one option to achieve this is to allow players to decide when they want to choose. For example, in good society, it's up to the players when they would like to play a resolve token. But this has an inherent problem, which is that some players will naturally exercise this less than others, and this will give them less control over the story. And this is okay to an extent, but at the end of the day, you do want every player to contribute. Uh, the other option is more like taking turns, uh, which is to sort of force players to step up, step up to the plate. Um, and if that's the option your game will use, if you're going to give every player a time when they have to say something, you need to make sure that players are going to feel comfortable and confident when they need to exercise their agency. And how can you do this? You need to make sure that players have something to have, hang their hat on, whether it's desires of the characters, prompts that help them know what is happening or anything else that you can think of. Some, basically anything that helps them go, oh, I know what I should be doing next. I understand the thrust that this is driving towards or like I, I have a basis on which to make my, my decisions on what should happen next. Um, secondly, they need to understand how their choices is, are going to affect the game. And that's about making it clear what, how that moment is part of a greater whole and how any mechanics might engage based on their decision. Mm -hmm. um, so both of those things are really important. Um, in supporting that player, empowering that player to actually make the choice when it's their turn to speak. That's right. Yeah, I think that's the case. And um, The Hour Between Dog and Wolf, which is a game about an investigator and a serial killer going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, is a good example of this. So to take their turn, the player first gets a prompt from the framing table, and then they choose a scene type from the list and set a scene goal. And this is a pretty simple step-by-step -step process. Each choice feels small, but by the time you get to the scene, you have a very good idea of what's going on. And the scene types themselves uh, provide cues as to what the scene explores, which gives players even more to jump off. Now, obviously, you need to strike a balance here. There can't be too many choices or it becomes just as hard to make decisions. But providing that support for players to make choices when your game calls on them to do so is very important in allowing players to genuinely exercise agency. Yeah. One of my favorite tricks for this is to have like a backup list of suggested things when, when people really can't, when they're scribbling about and they're like, oh, I, I can't think of the next input that, I, that this game is asking me. Say so it's like, ask a question and, and they can't figure out what question to ask next. Sort of have a backup table uh, to, to, um, so that they can refer to that and be like, oh, okay, I'll just take a look. There's three options here. Let me just pick one. So just being able to um, give them the information they need to access at those different times can also mm -hmm. be helpful. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's finish off the section <laughs> on play agency. Um, I'm sorry for going a bit off script there. Uh, here are some additional points to consider. Uh, so what about mystery or surprise? Um, I personally don't think this is a huge excuse to abandon player agency. 
I am surprised all the time in games where I also felt hurt about the way that the story was going. And I feel much more emotionally engaged in that surprise when I feel like I'm complicit in the story that's surrounding it rather than having it thrust upon me. And the yes. other one is what about games that operate by intentionally removing agency? Um, I think these, this is totally okay um, as long as players understand that and are giving their informed consent, C points A that we were talking about. But you do need to have like that big warning sign um, that when if you are going to do this in your game and it has to be a deliberate and well thought out feature of your game as opposed to an accident. Mm. Um, so, so those are the, that's player agency. Um, the final tool we're talking about today of these three is fictional levers. Uh, these are fiction facing mechanics that uh, players use to create an emotional experience. A very simple example are the bonds that commonly appear in all PBTA playbooks that form relationships between PCs. Mm, and I like to refer to them as fictional levers because you can pull on them, but you don't have to. Maybe I don't care who my old flame marries, right? Maybe my entire life is dependent on it. It depends how hard the player wants to pull that lever. You might even have heard people say during play, oh, you pulled on that really hard. I pulled on our old flame relationship really hard during that scene. And the idea of the lever is important because it shows that the mechanic creates an opportunity not a set story. And this goes towards the idea of agency, which we talked about earlier. Fictional levers uh, help with good emotional storytelling because they engage the care factor. They are things that make you care where you might otherwise not have cared. And they create things to care about where there were none before. Um, so if you take an example, if you will, of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, do I, a simple bystander, care if Jane Bennett? marries Charles Bingley, probably not, who cares? But if I'm the sister of Jane or Charles, suddenly I care very much a lot and will do things like walk to Netherfield through the driving rain to get sick <laughs> or write very snide letters. Um, levers create opportunities to engage. They create the opportunities mm. to care. Um, and fictional levers, uh, I think, are basically infinite in their scope and possibility. So this is where the viewpoint of the creator really comes into account. There is no right way to do this. Um, we can only speak from our personal experience. Um, so if you'll allow us to speak from our personal experience. Um, we found that most emotional levers in RPG e either resolve or either revolve around connection and intimacy um, or hard decisions. So let's start by talking a bit about connection and intimacy. So this is pretty intuitive. The closer we are to someone or something, the more we care about it. And nowadays, we are seeing this in most games. I think we're moving away from the adventuring party in a strange land who just met in a tavern and don't know each other. Um, and we know that this is a great way to ratchet up the stakes. So defending a foreign town from a dark magic is not as emotional as defending your hometown, right? Um, but I think where we still struggle is the idea that connection and intimacy is about relationships, yes, but it's also about inviting those relationships to become impactful in the story, to uh, mess shit up, so to speak. <laughs> so charged relationships. Um, this means people who want things from each other. And even better if they want different things from each other. Love, revenge, forgiveness, alone, a secret. There's infinite things people could want from each other. And when people want different things from each other, you have a charged relationship. Charged relationships will naturally want to shift and change. They will take you through the entire emotional roller coaster uh, until eventually those wants are fulfilled or rejected. A lot of the time we do this better with non-player characters than we actually do with player characters. We tell GMs a lot of the times that NPCs should want things from player characters because basically that's plot, right? <laughs> but we sometimes don't give enough attention to the way it works between player characters themselves. Oftentimes there's not enough support into that area of the game. Um, a great example of where player character relationships are considered explicitly is in Before the Storm, which is a game about an impending battle, uh, which has something called disagreements. During character creation, each character picks another's uh, strong belief who they disagree with and write down what upsets them so much about that. This is their disagreement. Um, during the game, you can raise disagreements to earn points that influence the final battle Characters also know juicy secrets about each other, which are revealed throughout the game and fundamentally challenge those characters' beliefs. 
This is a very explicit part of the game. Hmm. Uh, so let's talk a bit about hard decisions. Uh, so again, as game designers, we intuitively know how important hard decisions are. In games with GMs, we tell them to make the characters choose. Uh, and quite a few games recently have this idea of the devil's bargain. I think the reason we love it is that it is emotionally poignant, having to choose between two things that are important. Choosing already creates a sense of responsibility, of agency, that draws in players even further. Um, however, the hard decision doesn't need to be just the GM's domain only. We can actually build it into our games. Uh, one way to do this is at a character level by providing vehicles for obligations, beliefs, and desires. These are often set up in the beginning of the game and expand from there. Uh, an example of that is the hard holder in Apocalypse World. Uh, they have an obligation to their holding, they have ambitions for their holding's future, and they have the power and the agency in their game to have, to have to choose how they handle these things in play, how they will grow their holding, what their holding will become. Mm. So that's built in right at the start. Yeah, and you can do this even more explicitly. And I think a good example of this is the Janus playbook from Masks. So they are torn between their mundane and superhero obligations. And the playbook makes the expectations on them very clear. The important thing is, uh, for a game design perspective, even if the conflicts are set up in the beginning, you need mechanics that will help them arise in play. So uh, as I said, it's not just set and forget. So in the Janus playbook, there is a move you roll when time passes that creates new problems with your mundane obligations. And that keeps bringing that back to you. So it really hits home. Um, you're not limited to playbooks in how you do this. Uh, you can embed choices into the very fabric of your game. Burning Wheel has beliefs that are constantly being tested and changing, uh, but there are games that explicitly force you to choose in fiction. Um, in the game that I'm making at the moment, Village Song, um, there is, you know, the, the turn that you take in your game, you draw a card and the first thing is you have to choose, uh, a you have to make a decision in fiction. So in this card, it says, do you journey the dangerous path to commune with a past ancestor or do you give the chance to another leader? Why? Like that's a decision that is inbuilt into the game um, and you can't step around it. That's just, that <laughs> is your turn. That is the game is, hard in the, is making those choices. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a few more points to I'd like to add to wrap up this section on fictional levers. Uh, you can scale these concepts uh, for the emotional landscape of your game. So in cozy games, your smaller choices can have larger impacts. In like heroic fantasy games, the stakes need to feel a lot higher. Um, so scale your fictional levers to the emotional space that you're trying to hit. Mm. Um, and to connect some of what we've talked about so far, buy-in is actually really important to the effectiveness of fictional levers. So it needs to feel natural for players to engage, to reach out for the lever, right? And it's not going to feel natural unless players have had a hand in forming those levers or the context around them in the first place. All right. Yeah, so that's basically uh, what we wanted to... <laughs> I messed up your name. <laughs> it's sorry. creative. It's creative. I like it. It's very artistic. Um, uh, yeah, that's basically what we wanted to talk about today. Um, so sort of in summary... Emotional storytelling is awesome. It's a huge reason why I play role-playing games. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also fraught because emotions are fraught and we're all emotional creatures. Uh, so for that reason, it's important to take a proactive and responsible approach to the way you treat emotional engagement in your game. But it's also good to support that kind of role-playing and help people enter into that space as well. So these are the tools that we've spoken about today. Buy-in player agency, and fictional levers. Mm -hmm. um, so we will take questions now uh, until the end of the yeah, hour. So we've got, got plenty, of time. Minutes, plenty of time. Um, so if you have questions, you can pop them in the chat, but we will scroll back up yes. the chat. Is this what you're saying? Yes, you we'll scroll, scroll back, back up and take a look at the first question that we have okay. from Tony. Cool. So do you all have any thoughts on engaging emotions in conjunction, conjunction with real life metagame? like Dread or Starcross with its in real life tension. Engaging in the with real life metagame. I think I understand the question yep. there. So do we have any thoughts about games where there is literal tension happening because mm -hmm. you're pulling out a Jenga block 
that mm-hmm. mirrors mm-hmm. the emotional tension that mm-hmm. is happening in the game. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for those. I think those are great. That's like a really good example of how you use mechanics to sort of enhance the emotional engagement in the game because mm-hmm. it is putting you into a, a similar state of mind. I would say like, yeah, like in both of those in um, Dread or Starcross, because you naturally, when you play trademark Jenga game, yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> When you're pulling that block, it's really hard to not have that physical reaction of your hands are shaking and, and your heart is beating fast. And the game is basically the game design is basically using that um, that automatic response um, in a clever way to tie in with the theme. So that's that's I, I think they're great. Yeah. And I guess my view is that um, you know things like pulling out a block from a Jenga tower create tension in real life. But tension also is being experienced in real life by the mere fact that you're having a conversation. So these, that's a bit abstract, but like these <laughs> tools, they just bring out the natural tension that exists in the moment of you having an emotionally engaged conversation and make it tactile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> that might be a bit, uh, a bit abstract. abstract. Um, but it, it but I, I think it's true. I think they're great tools to harness something that's already there. In yeah. Short. Yeah. There's a bit of a chicken and egg. Thing there, but <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think in those games, it probably is that you have that charged story already, and then the, the mechanics can yeah. bring that out further. There's another the next one question. There. there, it's right there. Oh, here. When you make these games, do you take any consideration into the closeness or comfortability between the players themselves in like in real life, or do you just assume that you can't control that? like con tables and leave it to safety tools etc i think we probably we do think about both we like consider our games in both lights um and make sure uh we design to the lowest standard usually like as in <laughs> as in how do you, you mean this the we design for people who aren't yes. familiar with each other yes. in real life yes yeah, yeah that's what we, I mean. we design for strangers because the thing is we want a game where people can get emotionally invested, even if they're strangers. Yes, yes. That's and exactly. so that is that is what we design for. Um, and I don't think ever any, I don't think we've ever in any of our games presumed or required or designed to any real life relationship between the players, um, even to the point of uh, making our games accessible for online play. So yeah. we're not even presuming that they're in the same room. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's really important because really no matter the context you want people to feel comfortable safe and able to engage yeah but i think what we do think about when we are like oh yeah but what would a, a comfortable game group who play this a lot um we sometimes do think about like is there enough uh space for them to like take that further and uh yeah enjoy like what what can be really enjoyable for those groups as well and make sure that that's available in some fashion that's that's well. actually very true yeah um Okay, I saw another question. Here we go. There. How do you view the interaction of thematic relevance as a tool for improving buy-in? For example, a game about overcoming fascism fascism or stopping a plague is likely to get far more buy-in at present due to current events. Sorry, I'm a bit husky. I just came out of a, a game <laughs> <laughs> right before this. Uh, yeah. Um, I think theme is really important in buy-in because yeah. some themes people can identify with right away, um, either because they're just very universal or because they're currently relevant, um, like those examples that you use. In fact, I think theme can often be a way to shortcut buy-in, like when you say Jane Austen role-playing game or like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Fight with Spirit, which we have coming up, sports anime role-playing game, people are in the right milieu in their head already, like they're ready to go. It doesn't mean that we don't have to do anything. We still have a lot of work to do, but it does get you there. But with games that have a theme that is less obvious uh, or less accessible, you actually have to do more to encourage buy-in to help people get there. And I think Alas for the Awful Sea was a really good example of that for us because uh, it's not immediately clear what the space of the game is. And we had to work really hard to help people enter and engage with that and build that. Mm, yeah. And neither of those is, is better or worse, but it just yeah. gives you an idea of like where you should do, where, where's the best bang for your yeah. back as a designer? Like where should you focus your efforts? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. It just tells you what the problem is you need to solve for, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Keep, keep giving yourself briefs are great. Question, 
why why are you two such <laughs> awesome game makers uh, how dare how dare no <laughs> i don't know we're australian we're not uh, awesome uh, moving on moving on <laughs> uh da, 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 da. what challenges and opportunities oops i missed one yeah i'm sorry you want to read this one? Okay. Question. How do you approach the consideration that players will sometimes want to damage relationships between mm -hmm. characters? Should this be encouraged as equally as choices that enhance relationships? And how can you prevent negative bleed that could come from mechanics that reward players for a degree of conflict with each other? That's a really Ooh, great, great question. question. Very loaded. Let's do it bit chunk by chunk. Yeah. So firstly, damaging the relationships between characters is part and parcel of the drama genre mm -hmm. I would argue mm -hmm. and good society is all about that you have to tear it apart to put it back together again uh, specifically when you play with a drama tone yeah um so it, it can be very high conflict and very destructive relationships even sometimes but the important thing is that the players themselves don't feel a part of it so the characters might be tearing each other down but the players have to feel completely safe completely comfortable and like they know what's going on and they've agreed to participate in this. Yeah. And the way the difference is you feeling like you are both uh, like authoring your characters uh, relationships being, you know, destroyed in a negative way, but you as players are both on the same team for that. Mm. Um, that's usually how we like in good society, at least that is how we stepped around it. Yeah. It's about, um, you know, one of the player agenda things is, orchestrate your own character's misfortunes yeah. and have other people be part of that and invite them to be part of that. But that's not about you tearing it down another player on the table. It's yeah. always a, a collaborative approach. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we think a lot about that when we do design games. We think about, like, this is what we're, we were sort of talking about when we were saying, um, if your game has high conflict again uh, with yeah. the, the characters and it also also on top of that has a high degree of character embodiments that might lead to bleed yeah um then you're going to need to be prepared that a outcome of that might be that people have the best intentions are collaborating but then they get bleed and they get a bit carried away their emotions and then it does lead to actual like that negative emotion bleeding into a relationship so if that's your design problem uh you're going to need to think about solutions and there's a again a million different ways of how you might want to solve that yourself from having a break or like having a de-escalation um, mm -hmm. type mechanic or some form of checking in, like it could be a safety tool thing, it could be a part of the game thing. I, I don't know, I'm talking off the top of my head. <laughs> it's about yeah. outlining what that problem looks like. And yeah. Brainstorming solutions. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, I would say that, we're just going to talk about the same things we talked about already, but informed consent, right? And, mm -hmm. and the ability to choose if you're entering a game where you know there is the potential for uh, relationships between characters to be damaged, that should be very clear and players should be able to choose that. So in good society, for example, you choose the tone of your mm -hmm. game um, and you can choose to have a heavier tone, which is more likely to create more intense relationships uh, or you can choose to have the romantic comedy tone where you kind of know from the beginning that, yeah, but we're going to get back together again and we'll be kind of fine. Eleventh hour, good things um, happening. <laughs> and additionally to that, the fact that you know that you're going to break up and get back together again or whatever it is <laughs> helps you do those mm. really tough moments, right? Like mm. it's easier for people to embrace moments where their characters are going to hurt each other um, knowing that they know where the story is going overall in the very, very general sense. Yeah. Whether it's going to continue to spiral downhill or whether it's going to come to an ending where there is reconciliation. Yeah. Cool. We're, we're, we're here. What challenges and opportunities do you think are posed by using a randomized mechanic like a die roll in the emotional play space? Great question. That is, yeah, that, that is, that's an interesting one. So die rolls are great um, because they have the tactile tension, tension, ten, like a tense point, and then a result, like a the dam breaking, the outcome being on the table. Um, that's cool, and it's randomized to a degree as well. Yeah, but I think that we operate in a very emotional play space, as mentioned, and we are definitely moving away from random randomness. It's mm. random randomness as a way of resolving things randomness is a way of introducing things 
I think you I think it it's still it's still a thing we do. For example, in Village Song, you draw a card. That card creates a new change that's yeah. sweeping over the yeah. island. So randomness has introduced that. However, we are moving away from randomness as a way of resolving things, for example, deciding whether you succeed or fail. And for me, the reason for that is around agency because mm. I just really want people to feel like they're in control of their own story yeah. and that they can drive it where they want to drive it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what your view is on that. I mean, I agree largely just because I am sometimes one of those players that like, I really want this to go badly. I'm like, please roll bad. <laughs> Uh, uh, please roll. Yeah, I've been good. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do. I, I think I do tend to like more control because it it allows you to, t um, as a player. I mean, as, as well as and I, but I that influences how I think as a game designer is that it, you are able to drive towards emotional spaces much easier than if you have randomized elements in resolution. Um, however, that said, I could see like you know, that's just our. I, I'm sure you can make it work. Yeah, like yeah, it's one of those I agree with like, that. I, I'm 100% sure yeah. you if you, that's the thing that, like, it's a fun design problem as well. Like, mm. um, but I think the, so the opportunity, I think, is that if, if maybe it's with, you can still have that control, but like that, add that wrinkle of like, um, randomness, it could, it could be really interesting as well. So, yeah. It can be done. It's about, yeah, it's, it's a balance between. Probably not by us, but it can be done, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, it's a balance between tension and control. Yes, yes. exactly. Um, uh, next question. Can you please discuss the difference in emotional impact when playing online versus in, in person? person? That's a really interesting question. Yeah, we play a lot online because we live in Australia. We live in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Even within the Australian gamers, a lot of us are in different yeah. cities, so there are literally hundreds of kilometers between us. Yeah. So online we play a lot, but we have a few in-person groups as well. Um, I think personally, it doesn't have to have an emotional difference. I, I like in, t in that I, sorry, what I'm trying to say is I think either in person or online, you can have an emotional storytelling experience. I don't think yeah. one or the other would preclude you from yeah. doing that. I think that they both are different in different ways, but, um, they're both good vehicles for role-playing and storytelling yeah. and being able to engage. My personal experience, if I had to draw a differentiation, would be that people can get into a more intense emotional space online. Mm. And that is because people are uh, more focused on what is actually currently presently happening in the game as opposed to the interpersonal element of being around the table with each other and the socialness of that. But that's that might just be my own personal experience. Um, but I don't think that's inherent. I think how comfortable... The group of people are playing together and how how safe and um how heard you feel together is much more influential counterpoint i do think that some games like 10 candles which rely on physical yeah, atmosphericness true. can foster intimacy and yeah. closeness in a, in a physical way and yeah. that's a cool thing um you can't do it, it would lose something to be in a dark room online maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. not. I think it really depends no on the I think person. that's true there are some games that are built with very in-person mechanics yeah yeah but apart from those things I think it, it is both to equal degree there question <laughs> how important is creating the right mechanics to tie in with the emotional story of what you want to make next or is it a close secondary I think it's you. I think it's very, very important, important. <laughs> very the most important uh yeah um that is something that we absolutely constantly and consistently aim to do. Um, like that is whether we succeed really a key goal. goal in all design yet. Yeah. Yeah. Whether we succeed or fail, that is, a that is a key goal we, we have, yeah, we, that, we that the mechanics tie in with the emotional story of what we want to make next. Um, so important that that's why I think Fight with Spirit has taken us a really long time because yeah. we haven't like quite cracked it and we don't, we can't, they're not cracking it perfectly like into well not perfectly but like to the standard that we want it to be like we think it's really important so it's the time it's the part of our game design and i think takes a really really long time is mm -hmm. like understanding that emotional space and optimizing for it mm, i think that's right the mechanics it does take a long time. yeah and and even that's like fun. i will often and v as well when mm -hmm. we work together we'll, we'll often think about the um like emotional 
outcome we want and then mm. think about what mechanic might start behind that. Yeah, For example, we're just starting now on uh, a game called The Firm, which is a legal drama. And um, we noticed that when watching legal dramas, there's a sense of like you're always on call, you know, like you can never just do one thing. Mm-hmm. There's always people with constant demands, constant pressure on you. Clients or your bosses. Um, or yeah. Whatever. And and we sort of we've reflected that in the game with this phone call mechanic where when you're doing something, someone can call you up and be like, hey, you need to do this other thing for me. You should be somewhere else. I have this other demand of you to create that sense of emotional pressure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it takes a long time. And yeah. It, it takes a long time. Looking in different systems. testing. Ca- yeah. Into, into like how they all interrelate and stuff. It t- can take a little bit of time. Yeah. Play testing is really good for that too. Looks like we've got another question here. Mm-hmm. By the way, if we've forgotten, if you've had a question <laughs> and we, haven't. we just scrolled past it because it didn't say question or uh, whatever, please feel free to repost it. Um, yeah, pistolary section of good society specifically interact with player emotional states. It's huge. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Do you want to talk about it first? Um, I think that really for me, from looking over like all the games of good society we've played, I think the epistolary phase has been good for two, <laughs> three things. <laughs> um, reflecting on your own what's happened to you because you know people often go back and like say oh this has happened or, yeah and, and write that editorialize it that's the thing. yeah yeah it's, it's not just they recounting it's recounting it's it through the, the glorified lens monologue yeah. right so that that allows them to to make more complex characters so they're reflecting on what that character might feel or think about the events that have passed so that's always great for in, um making the emotional buy-in greater in, in that character and uh, the other thing that happens a lot during Epistolary is um, secrets come out, and that's always like good for that. that those yeah. levers are is it a good opportunity to pull on those levers in a semi yeah. in in a letter? And then the last thing that happens is that it's a good way for people to plan what's happening for the future, yeah. and that helps people to have informed consent going into yeah. the next phase of the game. Like what might be happening? Yeah. Oh, I've written a letter where I'm meeting with so and so to talk about X and Y. Yeah, just like helps all those three things and during the epistolary you take turns so yeah. each player has two turns which has again that thing of like every, every player has the agency to do what they want to do in this section be it express something that happened in the past or set something up for the future um and you sit there thinking hey what would be cool for me to do right yeah. now where do i want the story to go what would you yeah. know what what do i want to get out of this um and so i think it plays a really important role in the game for that reason as well mm-hmm. another question Game moments that ask for the, uh, specific emotional responses via a random output list of choices. How can you help keep established buy-in for more narrow channels of agency, which might create more possibility for a mismatch? So my understanding of this question is it's stuff like in masks where you have conditions, mm, for example. Yeah. Um, so, hey, this mechanic has happened to you. Now choose from this list of emotions. Yeah, How do you feel yeah. about that? I would say that is about the skill of the game designer <laughs> accurately understanding, accurately yeah. making a list that is likely to hit a high percentage of use cases. Like what I mean by that is like, if I'm playing that game and I look at that list of five conditions, is it likely, what's the likelihood that one of those five things is the thing that I, I want to mark at this point? And, and that would make sense in the fiction. Yeah, in fact, it's got to follow. Yeah, and, and that's, I think from, if you're looking at that from as a game designer, um, to make a good list like that is about thinking about understanding really well what the emotional space of your game is and what is the most likely things that yeah. um, that need to go on that list in a and and working out whether you want to write them generally or more specifically and that's also another thing because the more general you make it the more it covers but then the less specificity you have but if you have and you might lose something in your game design. If you have more yeah. specificity, then you need to be able to narrow the available emotional space somehow. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, I would say like the list needs to perform the function of allowing people to easily put what they're already, the character's already feeling or what the character could potentially be feeling from this moment into a solid and concrete selection. Mm. So it can't be, okay, now feel this way, but it can be, okay, in like, now you're feeling this way, what is it? Pick so that we can see the follow on, follow through of that yeah, yeah. in my, in my view. Yeah. 
then the other thing I would say is like um, a lot of uh, having a catch-all can be a, a helpful way of, of give one of those. I mean, it's a less good option. I don't always do this. Uh, like have one action, uh, one of those things in the list be a more broad thing to, to be able to catch um, any, any circumstances that don't fit into the other four. Yeah. Um, Make up your own is always a good a way I see people get around that. We're almost out of time. We uh, so let's, we're just going to have one more question. Uh, let's let's just answer this one question. What do you think the pros and cons are between in-character player authorship and meta player authorship? Are there certain things they are better suited for? <laughs> Another really interesting question. These oh, questions so have been these amazing. Are great. Yeah, you guys have been great. Um, it's actually something that we think about a lot mm. um, because of the fact that our mechanics tend to operate some in the character level and some in a player level. Um, and I think they perform different functions. Mm. I feel like player level input is more about being a participant in the wider story and an overall sense of investment in that story and in the story of other players. Whereas in character input tends to be more immediate it's more like reaching for the lever and pulling it in my experience mm, i see don't know mean. if you feel that way no i agree with that and especially like the, the meta version um where you were saying participating in the game group it's um more broader than like the specific uh character input of like this is my character background which is also good because it allows other people to play with that but it, it is yeah it, it's worth thinking about separately i think those two yeah. Do we want to keep rapid firing and yeah, use our last let's, minute? All right. Let's keep, go <laughs> We're making up. games that use moves like a lot do now, day, now these days. How do you balance these actions to not feel too limited but also distinct from one each other? Have you ever made moves that you cut because they had no use or split a move into two aspects because it was too broad? Um, rapid fire answer to that question is yes. Uh, definitely like playtesting is huge with moves to see whether people... I'm going to repeat myself. Yes. Moves are levers. Yeah. People reach for them. Are people reaching for that move? Are they not? When are people reaching for that move? What circumstances? And do they feel satisfied having reached for that move? Do they feel like the reason why they're reaching for that move um, has actually borne itself into fruition through utilizing it? Cool. Um, specific examples of writing PBTA moves specifically. I think in the last, we have a chapter where we're like, this is how you write moves. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Like, it's been a while since we revisited that. I have to double check if anything's changed, but there is, there's a little like step-by-step -step thing in, in that book about that. Mm, yes. We did write that three years ago. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been um, a hot minute. Yeah. Uh, and someone has, uh, the, so it's been pointed out here, which is great. If your question doesn't get answered here, you can ask it again on the Metatopia discard, Discord. Discord. I can't speak. So hashtag, say that again. If, your question, if we don't have time to answer your question, please go ahead and ask it again in the Metatopia Discord in the hashtag panel watch party channel, and we will get to it there. The book we were referring to was Alas for the Awful Sea, where yes, we have a session on Sea. PBTA moves. Yeah. Um, so let's let's actually wrap up. Yes. Because now we yes. have <laughs> two, minutes, two to minutes to go. <laughs> Whew. Whew. All right. That's us. We hope you had a lot. Uh, we got a lot. I can't speak either. <laughs> that rapid fire really did it to yeah, us. Yeah, it really, it really did a number on us. There's two panels that we'll be checking out during Metatopia that are on a similar topic area to this talk. Mm. You might want to give them a listen to also. D52, Crafting Game Mechanics to Support Player Agency. That's on Saturday at 12.30 a.m. EST. And then D85, Building Better Character Connections, Sunday, 9 a.m. EST. So I yeah. will check them. We're going to be checking them out. Yeah. We'll probably be in the chat for those. Um, and yeah, thank you, everyone, for your time today. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your super insightful questions. Yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll see you in the Discord. I uh, hope to get a chance to play with some of you. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, bye. <laughs>